<clears throat> Excellent. Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Brack Stovall, and tonight we have as our guest speaker, we have Dr. Rebecca Brannon, and uh, she is from James Madison University. And I will, uh, this is a uh, part of our 2021 Constitution Week lineup. It is Loyalist and the American Revolution. And tomorrow night in our next Constitution Week event is when author and historian Alexis Coe will discuss her George Washington biography, You Never Forget Your First. Now, before we get started tonight, just a quick reminder, there will be time for audience questions at the end of tonight's event. And if you have questions for our speaker, please feel free to put them into the chat box or the Q&A box at any time. Now, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Rebecca Brannan. She's an associate professor of early American history at James Madison University. She received her PhD from the University of Michigan. Her first book, From Revolution to Reunion, The Reintegration of South Carolina Loyalist, came out in 2016 from University of South Carolina Press. It won the 2016 George C. Rogers Jr. Award for the best book of the year in South Carolina history. The Journal of the American Revolution also named it to their 100 best books on the American Revolution list. She has also co-edited a collection of essays entitled The Consequences of Loyalism, Essays in Honor of Robert M. Calhoun. Dr. Brannon is currently working on a book about the founding fathers and their experiences with old age. Her new work on aging and masculinity has already received fellowship support from the Massachusetts Historical Society, Yale's Historical Medical Library, and the International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. She has also appeared on the Learning Channel's Who Do You Think You Are? and on C-SPAN's Lectures in American History. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rebecca Brannan. Thank you so much for that very kind welcome. And I must say, you must go to Alexis Coey's uh, talk too. I enjoy her book very much. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to talk about loyalists and I was I was joking with Mr. Stovall before we started. I obviously have a predilection for the losers. I've written about the loyalists a lot and I write about other people who kind of get ignored in the 18th century, whose perspectives we find difficult to understand or wrap our heads around or alienating or off-putting because a lot that is one thing that unites my research on old age and what it was like for people um, and what it was like to be a loyalist. But tonight we're talking about Constitution Week and I'm here to talk about loyalism. I have to give my book a plug. Here's the very, very pretty uh, cover showing the fraying fabric of the Americas. Um, but I wanted to start by talking about the loyalist perspective. Toppling monuments isn't so new. So uh, Robert E. Lee came down from Monument Avenue in the last month. Um, but when you wanna make a point, you pull down a monument. And so famously in New York City, uh, the colonists pull down the statue of King George III. We are done with you, George. We essentially reject all monarchical authority and we don't do it in some polite way. We literally pull the statue down um, and then take pieces of it through the street home as, um, you know, keepsakes. This is by the way, a circa 1852 painting that's nostalgic about the revolutionaries pulling down King George III. Um, so in a way, this is an odd moment in American revolutionary memory where we celebrate disorder and chaos and a disrespect to authority 
Um, and violence in the streets, which if you notice some of the men are carrying weapons and some of the men are carrying fire with which you could set fire to houses which all burn extremely easily in the 18th century because they're basically giant stacks of wood that go up um, at the drop of a hat. So there's a threat there uh, that I think maybe isn't as apparent today. And this is celebrated, right? People are really proud. We are the patriots and we create trouble. Um, from the point of view of the loyalists, this tells a different story. This tells a story about violence and about people using violence to silence some political points and their political opposition and literally threaten their lives. This comes after um, colonists in Boston had literally pulled down a brick house, brick by brick in the middle of the night um, in anger at the Stamp Act. And so this is actually Thomas Hutchinson's house and they pull it down and everybody in Boston, because it wasn't that big a place, can hear the bricks coming down all night. But in the morning, when questioned, people say things like, I didn't hear anything, I don't know what happened. Um, to the loyalists, this is terrifying. This is about disorder. This is about threat. This is about unnecessarily encouraging the mob. They don't see this as a romantic mob in which the people are represented. They see it as um, a overturning a perfectly good constitutional authority to get what you want. Um, because from the point of view of the loyalists, and then from the point of view of all of the American colonies, the mainland American colonies, up until about 1774, the British were the exemplars of constitutional liberties. When we talk about the constitution, we in the United States claim to have the oldest written constitution that is still in force. Uh, but the British claim to have a constitution even older than ours. They say they have the oldest unwritten living constitution. And people in the 18th century understand themselves to be the freest people in the world because they're living in British North America and English liberties make them free. And they understand themselves to be living in a constitutional monarchy. In that there is a king and he is honored, but there is also a parliament who has power and authority and that they have constitutional rights um, and constitutional liberties, as they would put it, and constitutional protections. So from their point of view, right, we were living in a constitutional moment where we had, we had a safety um, and protection from the British constitution. And now these crazy people want to literally overturn it, pull down the King's statue, thereby inviting the King's army to come invade New York, which is, by the way, what they did, right? The King's army shows up in New York City by the end of 1776, and New York City falls. They cannot hold their independence. In fact, during the American Revolution, militarily, the United States cannot hang on to any major city. Every single one falls to the British once the British make a serious attack. So from the point of view of the loyalists, first, are you crazy? Um, and second, we're not assured that this is good for us. We think that you are overturning authority all too easily. And when you overturn authority, you don't necessarily get another constitutional arrangement that protects people. What you might get is rule by the mob or rule by a tyrant or any number of really unacceptable living conditions. And why would you ever walk into that lightly? And they accuse um, these, uh, rebels, as they call them, of accepting this all too lightly. And they're not wrong about a lot of this. So um, the Patriots, even before they have an official government, have the committees of safety, as they're called. And what the committees of safety do is they're a quasi-militia, quasi-police force quasi strong arm of the Patriot government that doesn't yet exist, searching out suspected political dissidents and publicly torturing them and humiliating them as a warning to other political dissidents to shut up 
And if not believe something different in their heart, at least acquiesce to the patriot political line and not speak out, thereby giving courage to others. And so here you see, right, the public uh, humiliation and essentially torture, right? Uh, tarring and feathering is a kind of torture. This is, see, they're swinging him up. Uh, they're not trying to hang him, but they're trying to make him uncomfortable. Um, and you see all kinds of this and they're using ways that 18th century people had historically disciplined uh, bad leaders um, or horse thieves. And here uh, they turn it against the Tories. And that's why this one's called the Tories day of judgment, right? Uh, but from the perspective of these loyalists, right? This is what meets you if you resist quasi-governmental authority that actually has no backing or authority, like the committees of safety who report on people. Um, they begin to enforce oaths. And then once there is a new patriot government, the states enforce loyalty oaths and they can give them to anybody, right? They can just walk in, the sheriff can say, you know, we hear that while you were drinking in the tavern, you said some things while you were really drunk. Now you have to take a loyalty oath. If you refuse the loyalty oath, you have singled yourself out as a political opponent, a loyalist. Um, and these folks are subject to escalating economic and social pressure. Um, such as people boycotting their stores in particular, um, people uh, refusing to do business with them, uh, canceling marriage arrangements, um, and then it escalates into threatened violence, and then this kind of violence, and the threat is often if you persist, somebody's going to kill you. Most people get the hint after this kind of behavior and they flee. Um, so from the point of view of a loyalist, this is an irregular government at its best, which is desperate to use extra legal means to um, enforce its ideology on wavering people who it essentially judges as dissidents and prosecutes accordingly. And this stretches from the committees of safety led by the Sons of Liberty um, into the first loyalty oath circa 1776. Um, and through organized, especially in the South that I write about, uh, organized militia uh, units and the militia units who are patriot militias are not really used in what we would think of as traditional military conflict. They're used as a police force slash, um, I'm looking for the right word here, right? They're not just the police, but they are the de facto arm of the patriot government as a uh, terror spreading force designed to put enough pressure with burning down buildings, burning down crops, threatening women, um, to put enough pressure on women and children who've been left guarding the homestead to try to dissuade men from serving loyalist causes. So from the point of view of the loyalists, this is a dubious constitutional arrangement at best. Um, I always have to tell my students, who romant, like all Americans, right? I did before I got into this research, who kind of romanticized tarring and feathering as sounding kind of unique or interesting, or I'm not really sure what anymore. Um, it's actually painful and humiliating. And it's both painful, but if you pour the tar hot enough, you give somebody third degree burns over part of their body. And then you imagine this is an 18th century world. There are no antibiotics. Um, all these burns lead to open wounds in which all kinds of infection can enter. Um, and so dying is not out of the question from a severe tarring incident because it burns you so badly and the burning can not only weaken you but introduce all kinds of uh, germs that will eventually kill you. Um, and this is understood in the 18th century that tarring and feathering is not something they do lightly. 
um, it goes far beyond humiliation to great pain. The loyalist critique is not only that we're scared, but that this is a lawless endeavor. And that ordinary people are much better protect, protected by a constitutional order than a lawless mob. Um, and I like to read this quote. Uh, I don't know if anybody watching saw Hamilton, either on the stage or uh, listened to the soundtrack, but there's a moment where there's a, a loyalist trying to speak and then Hamilton comes and shouts over him. Uh, the words are actually taken from Samuel Seabury, who was a well-known loyalist who wrote on the subject. And in 1774, he wrote, peace, oh, sorry, peace and quietness suit you best. Confusion and discord and violence and war are sure destruction to the farmer. Without peace, he cannot till his lands and less protected by the laws, he cannot carry his produce to market. Um, many loyalists saw patriots as having begun a unwise or even unwinnable game with the British, which subverted the liberties of all, that the best guarantor, guarantor of constitutional liberties was life under the British constitution, which should not be lightly abrogated. They also tend to take what we might consider a traditional Tory view, meaning Tory in the British government sense, um, that you shouldn't lightly overturn any traditional arrangement because the chaos and propensity for mob violence is much greater. Um, and so this is again, the don't court change lightly school of uh, loyalist thinking. Um, as they move into the war itself, um, neutrality is almost impossible to maintain. Um, I often like to say the American Revolution was really a minority project. Um, a minority of Americans were actually patriots, were actually committed to the cause of American independence. Um, probably if we asked, <laughs> right, if there had been a Pew Data organization to take polls uh, and people could have been guaranteed anonymity, a majority of Americans were neutral. They would like to stay out of it um, and they don't have firm political opinions on either side. Then there's a small group of loyalists who are politically committed and who start with this sort of vague idea I've explained about we're safer with constitutional liberties, uh, don't let the mob rule. Um, and they'll come to enunciate this more clearly under the challenge of the war and come to make an argument that uh, Great Britain was a constitutional empire and, with its constituent parts and that they were better off in uh, a constitutional empire in which trade uh, benefited all. But the real problem is neutrality is very difficult to maintain during war. Um, anywhere the British troops come, they demand that uh, local men support the British cause. Uh, once they leave town, people who support the British cause are often punished. So yes, you cannot win this game. Um, and neither side manages to hold certain territories through the whole war. So a lot of Americans, experienced this sudden wrenching shift in um, what group controls their local area and the consequences for them. Um, and so you have loyalists and patriots who make up probably still a, major a minority together. And you have the vast number of people who end up becoming identified with one or the other, they're pushed into it um, and they wished they could remain neutral. I got interested in what happens to the loyalists after the war. Um, and I, I, I'm interested for two reasons. One, um, when I was introduced, uh, you heard that the title of my co-edited book is The Consequences of Loyalism. I came up with that because I think that's what we're talking about. Um, what are the consequences of choosing the wrong side in a civil war and then losing? 
but also what are the consequences of having a particular ideological view of how constitutions should work, and then uh, having to reassess and rethink because of how things turn out for you. When I started my first project, I knew that there were probably at least 500,000 loyalists in the 13 colonies, and even more of these people we would call disaffected, who aren't totally neutral, they don't tend to trust the patriots. Sometimes they don't trust them because uh, in a lot of places like uh, Virginia and even more in South and North Carolina, they're identified as the elite who had uh, not shared political power with the growing West um, and often ignored those who they found um, uninteresting or not rich enough to worry about also in the West. And there was a lot of resentment that had built up. And many of those people um, don't love the British government and they really don't trust the elite claiming to be patriots and they're disaffected about the whole thing. Well, I knew that only 30,000 or so of these loyalists actually left the United States. Now they become this diaspora and they have to leave and they write these plaintive and moving letters some of them humorously complain about the cost of living in London, which has been expensive for centuries. Um, some of them are forced to move to Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and they're constantly complaining about how cold it is. To be fair, they almost starved to death the first winter. Um, but I knew that if only 30,000 leave out of 500,000, then the vast majority of especially white loyalists stayed in the United States. Why didn't anybody know what happened to them? Why uh, should we not consider what happened to them? And so that's why I wrote a book asking the question, if the majority of loyalists stayed, how did they do that? How did they convince those who'd been victorious to include them in the United States? What kind of arguments worked? And what influence did they have on the new United States, um, given that they had not they had often been opposed to the project of creating it. Um, and I turned to South Carolina to answer this question. Um, and the reason I was drawn to South Carolina is because it was probably um, the nastiest uh, of all the fighting in the revolution. It was with the most guerrilla warfare. It was with the most, um, some of the highest casualty rates in the American Revolution and some of the uh, biggest um, personalities, shall we say. Um, it was also a place that gave rise to lots and lots of guerrilla fighting. And it was one of the places where I could find loyalists and patriots who were in fact in the same family. By the way, um, historians, or people who like to talk about the American Civil War often talk about it as brothers against brother. No, if you want to see brother against brother, father against son, go to South Carolina in the Revolution, um, where you literally find that, as example, the Lacey family. Uh, right before a battle, the um, adult son had come home, camped in his uh, father's place. He's a patriot. His elderly father is a loyalist and they catch him trying to sneak out of the house in the middle of the night to go warn uh, the nearby uh, loyalist militia. Now, because he's the elderly father of the commander, they tie him to the bedstead and watch him for the rest of the night so he can't get out. Um, had he been younger, they would have just executed him on the spot, right, for trying this. But it's a classic example of how nasty this could get. Um, and how much this is family split, of uh, course, across all kinds of questions about what is a good solution to this problem. Um, the British, they think that they're going to South Carolina to pick up loyalist troops who will happily help them subdue other regions. Um, they don't listen closely enough to their scout who tells them, oh no, these people are perfectly happy to fight, but what they'd like to do is get revenge on the patriots who have used this militia power against them for five years. 
And once the British show up in 1780 and put their power behind the group that had felt they'd lost, uh, a lot of those, especially the backcountry loyalists, turn out to mostly want revenge. They have no interest in uh, being a disciplined military marching towards Philadelphia or New York or Boston. Um, they plan to, as he puts it, be clamorous for retributive justice. What he really means is get back at them. Um, the thing is, this leads to guerrilla warfare and this leads to ever more of violations of the rules of war, which is why I chose South Carolina as an example. If they could overcome this, if loyalists could find ways to tell a victorious patriots, we will make good citizens of the new United States, even though we were opposed to it, I'd like to see what they had to say. Sorry. Now I got to the what I really want to talk about, sorry, um, which is after the war, uh, loyalists do many things to convince their former neighbors. One thing they do is convince them that they uh, have the fundamental attributes of good citizens despite their political beliefs during the war. They argue that they are good neighbors and good citizens. Um, and that essentially a country would be remiss, would be stupid to kick out perfectly good citizens um, who are contributing to community bonds and contributing to the economic welfare of all. They're more careful about making an argument that they get their um, allies who had been patriots to make for them. And the most compelling distillation of this is Christopher Gadsden, uh, who had made his patriot bona fides, had spent uh, some time in a um, British prison as a prisoner of war in St. Augustine, Florida, which cannot have been pleasant and was not pleasant. Um, and he wrote, he that forgets and forgives most is the best citizen. And that's a powerful idea, right? That revenge is not only not the answer, but to be a good citizen, you have to reject revenge. You have to choose to forget and forgive. Um, and Christopher Gadsden explicitly argues that in the circumstance of the loyalists. He says, you know, we need to forgive and forget. It's our obligation as citizens. It's how we build a vibrant new United States. It is the obligation of citizens. Um, it's a powerful and compelling argument. He has versions of it. The South Carolina General Assembly contemplates how should we punish the loyalists? Um, and they come up with, let's um, catalog the estates of everybody who fled for their lives, uh, which is some of the commanders, and go ahead and take those back to the state. And let's publish, a, let's in a debate in 1782 and come up with a list of 400 um, merchantile firms and uh, prominent individuals who they say, okay, they're unacceptable. Let's put them on the list. Let's confiscate all their property and sell it at public sales. Um, let's use the money to pay for everything the broke state needs so that we don't have to raise taxes on the population. Um, and of course their post-war uh, incredible damage, the need for a lot of um, state investment. Um, and so, in fact, if you, if you, like I have read a lot of these South Carolina legislative documents from the first decade after the revolution, um, <laughs> whenever they have a new pet project, they're not sure how to fund, they say, we'll take it out of the confiscated estates fund, right? We'll take it out of the money we took from the loyalists. On the other hand, um, they originally imagined that maybe the 
uh, more ordinary people would be charged with crimes by their neighbors and brought up through the justice system. Um, and something like this does happen in Virginia, um, but South Carolina rejects it. In part, citizens don't usually pursue it. In part, uh, the judges refuse either civil or criminal charges dating from the war or related to war acts. Um, and they try to persuade juries who have a lot more power in the 18th century system um, to also reject uh, the idea of seeking redress for wartime crimes, even crimes of uh, they understand to be war crimes, right? Uh, killing people off the battlefield um, or killing people after the battle is over. One man comes up and he's charged with uh, running his sword through all his neighbors when he sees them panting and dying on the field. And he's not doing it to be kind, put them out of their misery. He's doing it because he hates them. And he's just walking around the battlefield, putting his sword through them. Neighbors remember this vividly. Um, and charge him with basically war crimes several years later, um, and the prominent justice absolutely refuses. Now, I have to add the corollary to the story is the judge thinks he's persuaded them, and he's very proud of himself, right? His words have held off revenge, and he has persuaded them of the greatness of forgiving and forgetting. And he's gone up to his chambers, and only then does he realize that the crowd patiently waited until he left the room, grabbed the loyalists, dragged them half a mile, and hung them themselves. However, this is the only story like this from South Carolina. He that forgets and forgives most is the best citizen. And I, I trace it back to it. You know, Francis Bacon says the same thing. Uh, why should you stop? obsessing about revenge. Christopher Gadsden says it makes you a good citizen. It's what's necessary to live together in a democratic community. Francis Bacon says it keeps people from healing if they're constantly obsessed with revenge. So how do you create this reconciliation? How do you choose to be generous? The first answer is only some people get the generosity of the state and the generosity of their neighbors. The black loyalists, as they're known, have no choice. Um, they will be re-enslaved or massacred if they stay in the state. And just to be fair, loyalists and patriots are trying to capture them and re-enslave them for profit. Um, their best option is to take the British transportation that the British broad generally offer, and the British take him to Nova Scotia um, and offer them land along with the white loyalists in Nova Scotia. Um, they have no option to stay and reintegrate into the United States. Um, but in South Carolina, they passed this Confiscation Act in 1782, and they named 400 people which on the face of it is very harsh, but another way to look at it is they choose 400 unlucky people, um, many of whom had um, were either quite wealthy, uh, absentee landlords, so they're taking the property of people who are British citizens, not really loyalists, but also not living in the state. Consider these uh, spoils of war but at the state level rather than uh, individual spoils. They, they really offer a series of carrots and sticks. So when I went to look and I knew there were confiscation acts like this in every state, I just dialed down into the specific mechanics in the South Carolina example, and they're doing all kinds of things. So they say, um, they give out these official addresses. If you come back, to Patriot lines and you serve in the Patriot militia, now that it's clear the British cause has ended in America, um, we'll forgive you. But if you don't come, then we'll confiscate your property. And they report on, the legislature happily reports on how many people they got to come back that way. And so that's what I mean about a carrot and a stick. The stick is confiscation. Um, they also, uh, the legislature negotiates, they have two houses and they're negotiating with themselves. Um, as one opponent of 
confiscation said every man comes in with his own list of enemies and tries to add it to uh, our shared list of who's actually an enemy, right? It's his personal enemies, not loyalists. Um, but they also try to protect their former friends. Um, and there are examples of legislators writing to these friends, please just write me something, I'll save your property, but I need some sort of sign from you that I can give to these people that you are, uh, right, you're bona fide, I can speak for you, um, give me something. And then you also have, they're negotiating a lesser punishment, um, and they call it amercement, but we might understand it as a penalty, a financial penalty, and they choose a percentage of their total estate that they have to pay uh, to the state of South Carolina in return for their forgiveness. Um, for some people, it's as low as 6%. Uh, for others, it's as high as 25%, uh, but it is more generous than having everything confiscated. Um, and they're negotiating to get their friends on the list. Etc. Etc. Confiscation itself is enacted in 1782, and then the legislature reconsiders in 1784, and they have a commission, and they accept this pouring in of petitions from loyalists, some of whom write them themselves, many of whom hire a lawyer to write them for them, and they say all the right things, and they say. Um, what do they say? They say things like um, they never apologize. They don't apologize for their political opinions. They don't apologize for their military service. They downplay their military service. They say, yeah, I was in the loyalist militia, but I never harassed anyone. And I just took it on for the good of my community so that I could help out my friends and neighbors. And apparently people buy this. For conf confiscation is profitable for a few. So here I have a picture of Edward Rutledge and of course his brother, John Rutledge and they are a wealthy South Carolina family. Um, and Edward Rutledge at the time is uh, the speaker of the house of Repres the speaker of the house uh, in South Carolina's legislature, and his brother John Rutledge is the governor. Convenient, right? Um, and Edward Rutledge gets together a little trading company with a friend, and they pool their capital, and they start. He's the author of confiscation of the Confiscation Act. He is the Speaker of the House, gets it through the House, and then he makes a little profit on it. He and his friend buy up confiscated properties for pennies on the dollar with generous credit arrangements he had written into the legislation himself. And it's pretty profitable for the Rutledges. It's an administrative nightmare for the people who end up running it, um, in part because to be a financial officer of the government in the 18th century means you have to pledge your own financial resources against any improprieties in the numbers. But it also becomes a nightmare because the legislature quickly stops upholding confiscation and starts allowing all kinds of backdoor arrangements to get out of what punishment they did give people. And they accept these petitions and they were supposed to take all the property away from women and children. But who wants to turn a woman on the children in the streets? It makes an aristocrat look bad. So they start letting them have their, women have their one third traditional dower right. And next thing you know, some people bought the speculative investment and they're furious because now it's worth a third less than it used to be because they can't take away the dower right they paid for. Um, and all those legislators who think of the Confiscation Act as this magical slush fund for government are always frustrated because there's never enough money. Um, and in part because they're not actually that committed. Uh, confiscation makes them feel better and they undo it for most of the people on the list in 1784. So take away with one hand in 1782 and give back in 1784. I think they were on to something else too. Hi, yes, can I, I finish a... this one thing? Yes, or yes. Where are we for time? 
No, we're I good. I love this. We're good. Okay, so anticipating revenge feels great. Current psychologists tell us we love it. It feels wonderful. The anticipation, or what I call revenge talk. And uh, another leading South Carolina figure, Adonis Burke, has figured this out. And he says, you know, everywhere I go, the women are talking of bloodletting, just like men, and it's horrifying. Well, what he's listening to is revenge talk. Whoops. And <laughs> however, there's research that we get all of our pleasure and stimulation from the anticipation of just punishment. This revenge might be considered. However, the reality of actually watching punishment is a complete letdown. It's the pleasure of anticipation and believing you're gonna see justice enacted that does all the work in the pleasure centers of our brain. Um, and there's psychological research today to suggest this. And I think this is part of what uh, the loyalists figure out how to play on in the 18th century, right? Um, it feels good to imagine you're going to punish them. It doesn't feel that good to actually do it. And so in the end, I think loyalists work to um, build their own reconciliation. Uh, this is an example of one of these many petitions. Uh, restore him to his country and family and his whole life shall manifest his gratitude for your petitions and duty bound. So Mr. Stovall, would this be a good time to take some questions? Yes, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, one that, um, do you think that, um, you know, it's, it seems to be a free for all. Um, <laughs> uh, opens up to that. Um, let's see. I have yes. Um, it was early in the early in the program. We had a question: Is do you think that Benjamin Franklin, a patriot, secretly arranged the arrest of his son William Franklin, who was a loyalist, to be incarcerated in a Connecticut prison for two years in order to save him from fighting or being killed in the American Revolution? I don't know because I don't know if he was so angry he would have cared if his son died. And I, I think what what strikes me is 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 these uh, you know the events of the um, that you relate to in South Carolina just I mean it's incredible. Okay, well, how about black loyalists? Another comment and question was: Black loyalists supported the crown of Britain, Britain in return of special rewards such as freedom from slavery pensions, land grants. Uh, when Britain lost the American Revolution, did Britain live up to its promise to giving the black loyalists their rewards, particularly land grants? Not really, as I suspect whoever asked that was skeptical. So the good news is the British did give them land grants. The bad news is it was the most, um, it was the most invalu uh, uh, least valuable land the most sketchy land for agricultural purposes. And Nova Scotia isn't that good for agricultural purposes, period. Um, and so, right, black loyalists find themselves on this very tenuous land, um, but they also discover that the white loyalists are not willing to entertain them, are not willing to see them as fellow builders of this new world in, uh, this British held Northern North America. Uh, they don't really call it Canada yet, right? But this British held far Northern regions. And they, uh, some of the black loyalists, it's a fascinating story. Some of them found their own town, um, Birchtown in Nova Scotia. Some of them then later decide that it is just hopeless to live with white people in the British empire that they'll never get a fair footing. And they leave, some of them for Sierra Leone, Britain's back to Africa colonization, um, colony in Africa that they're trying to remove former enslaved people and send them back to Africa and Sierra Leone. And some of the uh, black loyalists take them up on it. 
uh, essentially give up on ever having rights in Canada. And a few of them are so desperate, they go to Australia in the days it's a penal colony. Um, and so they actually become world travelers seeking a better opportunity. Interesting. Well, the American Revolution, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, Britain did not have a whole lot of allies in that. And uh, one comment here was that the, uh, the world powers such as France, Spain, and the Netherlands were supporting the American colonists. And uh, with that, knowing that, do you think the British were stubborn and unnecessarily fought a war that they actually saw might be the writing on the wall? Uh, that they might ultimately lose? Never underestimate their stubbornness. <laughs> Never underestimate the stubbornness of a king because there's actually, a, and I didn't know this until graduate school, but there was tremendous opposition in parliament to the war. And there were an entire faction of uh, British politicians who thought the war was a terrible idea um, and an abrogation of British liberties. On the other hand, um, Britain lost the mainland North American colonies and gained India, and India made them richer. Um, and there's a British historian who's talked about Britain just learned to see its colonies in a different way. No longer did they believe that their colonists were like them, and therefore their colonists needed to be afforded rights and opportunities. They came to see the colonies as full of lesser than people and India becomes their lucrative example. Um, so they did okay. Okay, well, you talked about the re-enslavement of the African-Americans. What happened to the Native Americans who sided with Britain? That too is a hard story because they don't get all that much for the promises they made the British. Um, because the British lose, or concede to the Americans. Uh, our population as Americans just starts spilling west over the Appalachian Mountains. And I should say, I'm in Harrisonburg as I write this. So literally on the west, uh, 40 miles from the West Virginia line. And people just start pouring over the Appalachian Mountains um, into what had been Native American territories that the British had promised their Native American allies who lived there that they would protect. And those become meaningless assurances. Um, and there's this great 1784 quote I found where a Shawnee chief says, all we hear all day long is the sound of your saws, right? You are so close, we can hear you cutting down the trees to build your civilization. Um, and even for Canadian Native Americans, it's a very mixed story because, um, the Native Americans in what's now Nova Scotia and New Brunswick uh, find that in return for them supporting the British, they end up with more British settler colonists who start filling New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, hoping to make it a settled British white colony. And that means they want to take more Native American land. Mm. Well, back in the beginning, the loyalists, uh, did the loyalists uh, mistrust Hamilton's intentions, um, uh, like Jefferson and Madison believed that Hamilton's goal was to return the country to a monarchy? Uh, I don't think the loyalists, I mean, Hamilton is a patriot in his day. Jefferson and Madison are worried that he's too monarchical in his government choices after they won. Um, I would say that he, he is a defender of the loyalists and he's an, he argues for loyalist reconciliation. And Jefferson and Madison mistrust why, and they mistrust his, um, how much Alexander Hamilton was get, willing to give to the financial elite. And he thinks it's important to buy the affections and support of the financial elite in creating financial institutions for the United States, but he's actually willing to give them basically built-in profit in return for funding these institutions of the United States. And Jefferson and Madison uh, are correctly, I would say, nervous about where this is gonna go. Um, Madison probably more than, Madison in a more nuanced way than Jefferson. Um, 
but yeah, <laughs> Hamilton, I don't know how Hamilton became the hero, the immigrant hero of a musical because he's he was very much an elitist. Interesting. I've got a question myself. Uh, sure. Do you see parallels um, in our current events uh, to then? I mean, it's, it's like we've never really gotten over. Them. I mean, what, what parallels do you see? I see a lot. I see it as sort of a chastening thing. The loyalists weren't wrong when they said, um, you know, why would you throw over one set of constitutional protections for the hope of better ones? Also this way we romanticize as Americans, uh, the revolution as we see it, um, that we're sort of this ragtag band of militia and, committed activists who turn out in the streets to protest stamp acts and tea and nobody's quite sure what we protested but it has something to do with tea right um and we're the people shooting from behind the trees and before me there was a whole generation of historians who were influenced by the vietnam war and their question was sort of how in the world did we become the British army, meaning the regular forces, and other people became the scrappy guerrilla forces hiding behind the trees. We thought that was us. And that's the frame in which from Vietnam, they see the revolution, what on earth happened? And I actually began to think about this reconciliation problem um, right after 9-11 because that's when I had to choose a project back in graduate school for my dissertation. And I do think it's an influence being part of the 9-11. Uh, the people who are cogitating in the wake of 9-11 that, you know, how do we guarantee reconciliation in this world? There aren't very many good examples of it. There's lots and lots of examples of societies ripping each other to shreds. Um, and sinking ever lower over you did this and you did that. And, you know, I was kind of inspired by being able to find an example of a successful reconciliation. But now having lived through the um, events at the Capitol on January 6th and other things, I think more about how the loyalists thought about the value of tradition and precedent and everybody playing by the same set of rules. Well, how do you think the um, loyalists who moved on to Canada, who migrated to Canada, and it was still a co colony, um, how did that impact the eventual you know, independence that Canada, I mean, they have a, still have tight relations with England. They do. But, and they're how, sort of the counter example. How do you gain your independence without a war or a revolution? You know, is there an orderly way to become independent and still constitutional? And that's, they would say there's still a constitutional monarchy and Queen Elizabeth II is still their titular head, although it's very clear she has absolutely no political power in Canada at all. Um, but still the, the flags fly over and, and there's sort of a governor general's property at the bases and in most uh, provinces. Um, there is an argument that that's why the Canadian independence is so much more orderly. <laughs> They're settled by loyalists with an obsession about uh, political order and choosing the right process. But also there's an argument that Canada's long history of being um, less conflicted about immigration than we are, more positive about immigration in general, um, is because it's settled by a diasporic people who've been kicked out of the United States. And even if only 30,000 of them had to go, they were a pretty upset 30,000 who deeply identified with what it was to be an immigrant in a strange land trying to build a new civilization. And so there are Canadian historians who would say that's the other story of the revolution that it created another nation, Canada, with a really different political DNA. Interesting. Do you think that affects our relationship with Canada now? I mean, you know, Canada had a, has a, has a, you know, single payer health insurance and we're resistant to it. And we uh, have such really opposing ideas about what Canada does and as, as to what we do. What's that terrible joke? I think it was a, a, <laughs> a terrible joke that uh, Canada is a really nice apartment over a meth lab. <laughs> Um, but 
to be fair, what also shaped Canadian American relations is that um, we invaded them several times. And so for most of the 19th century, Canada, both British and then once it became independent, kept cannons trained on the border with the United States because we had invaded them multiple times and then we threatened to do it at other times. Um, but a Canadian I once knew told me that realistically Canada used to have a plan to defend themselves against the United States, even up to 1945, if we suddenly decided to invade them again, now they have no plan. Hmm. The plan is just to surrender and hope for the best. I thought it was alarming that this was something that Canadians talked about and joked about, um, but that's sort of a different take on it. All right, well, thank you. We're, we're coming up on the, on the top of the hour, as they like to say in public radio. Um, any more questions from anyone out there? I uh, think we answered most of the questions people submitted. Um, I really appreciate you being here tonight, Dr. Brennan. I've, uh, I've actually learned quite a bit myself now. Um, and, you know, it's a different, it's a new way of, it's actually a, it affects the way, you know, we even view our own history. Um, we have anything else? Do you have any closing statements at all? I'm still proud to be an American, but uh, <laughs> being losers is definitely chastening. Um, chastening about how sure we are about anything. Also, I love studying revolutions and I'm tired of living through them. 21st century can quit now, please. I agree. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And thank um, you. And I want to thank everyone else who came to uh, great to attend questions, this presentation. everyone. Thank you for your questions. And um, remember, tomorrow night we have our uh, program on our next program this week on uh, with Alexis Co. And she will discuss the George Washington biography. You never forget your first. Um, invite everybody to be here same time tomorrow night. So thank you very much, Dr. Brennan, and we shall um, hope to see you soon. Thank you, and I'm going thank to stop you the so recording much. now.